It is our favorite time of the week again. Time for hashtag Rising Cues when we get to answer your questions. All right, Sagar, what's up first? Number one, what do we got? What are your top trusted, if that's possible, sources for information nowadays? What do you think, Crystal? It's easy. Watch the show and you will know. <laughs> um, <laughs> all the guests we have. Yeah, th- them. A lot of people like- on Substack. Um, yeah, the, David Sirota is doing independent yeah. journalism. Matt Taibbi, Glenn Greenwald. Um, the folks, David, da- the folks of Brianna that we have on this yeah. show on a regular basis, we trust. We do try out new people on the show, you know, oftentimes who have interesting things mm-hmm. going on, but the ones that we have as our like core stable that you see all the time, we really feel like they're independent thinkers who are willing to call out both sides. And that's the big thing that is so rare to find um, in mainstream outlets, although you do see some good people there. Every once in a while. You know, Jeff Stein, Ken Vogel, you see people are really just reporting out the facts. But um, yeah, if you watch the show, you know who we're looking to for our information. Yeah, and that's the key, which is you got to find people who are either reporters at mainstream institutions who legitimately call balls and strikes and Mm -hmm. analysts and other people who come from the outside. Anybody that you see on the show basically is somebody who passes muster in our view, and it's an incredibly small circle of people. Uh, it's taken a long time to curate and find people who can resonate, but yeah. So if you watch the show, you understand. Small but mighty group yeah, that's, that's right. uh, trying to do the right thing out there. All right, second question. If QAnon continues on its current path, it may drive the GOP into the ground. Is it in both parties' best interest to unveil the identity of this mysterious Q? And who do you <laughs> think it is, possibly? My guess is Steve Bannon or Roger Stone. No, I have- it's not either of them. No idea yeah. who it is. Zero clue. Um, I haven't gone deep down the rabbit hole of what Q is actually mm-hmm. about and like all the internal dynamics. Look, of course, I think it would be better if it could be sort of exposed and dismantled. But I also think that interest in Q is on the wane anyway, yeah. in spite of what the media tells you. And that doesn't mean it's not a, you know, a, a somewhat dangerous fringe phenomenon to explore. But you've got Less than 10% of people who even not believe in Q, but even like mildly support Q in their theories, that's equivalent to, you know, the number of people like believing the moon landing was fake yes. and stuff like that. And there's anecdotal evidence that since Trump was not reelected and was not inaugurated, um, people are starting to move away from Q and on to whatever their next conspiracy theory is going to be. Yeah, I think that Q and much of the discussion around it is more of probably a proxy about like a dramatic drop in trust Mm. um, and a large population, especially older people in information. And that's very much worth considering. Like, how did this happen? Why exactly are people so prone to believing gigantic, insane conspiracy theories about the U.S. government? And so that's one way. And then the second way is like Crystal said, in many ways, they want to hold it up, the CNN and many these other people and encourage almost encourage Marjorie Taylor Greene to become the next nominee because they want the ratings. They're chasing those ratings from January 6th. They're trying to make it even more of a thing than it actually is. So trying to understand it as a phenomenon from their perspective, they're not interested. They just they in a way they want it to be bigger and better. Yeah. No, they they look, they profited off of Donald Trump. Yeah. They profited profit off of crazy. They did great when the Capitol was under siege. That was great for them. And so they're going to try to hold on to those vapors as much as possible. That's right. Last one. Last question. So thanks for explaining the ultimate ultimatum game about inequality. What do you think would be a fair income distribution for the top 1% and bottom 50? Right now, top 1% holds 30% of U.S. wealth. Bottom 50 holds 2%. What do you think, Crystal? So I pulled up some statistics on the way that wealth has changed just since basically the 70s and the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in 1983, Upper income people had 60% of the wealth and middle income people had 32%. Now upper income people have 79% of the share of U.S. aggregate wealth and middle income people are all the way down to 17%. What's more, uh, since the Great Recession, only the wealthy have gained in in income, um, which is really important to understand. And so rather than giving you a hard number, I think what we need to see is the reversal in the direction of the trajectory. So for a long time after World War II, we had a situation where the middle class was growing. They were taking up more of that Mm -hmm. aggregate share of wealth. That income disparity was actually lessening and flattening. Things were headed in the right direction. 
Now we have the exact polar opposite, of course, exacerbated by the coronavirus crisis, where the rich just keep getting richer and richer and richer, and everybody else is basically staying where they are and sharing an increasingly smaller piece of the pie. So to me, the big question isn't where should the final resting place be, but what should the trajectory be? We need to have policies in place and change our society so that we now have a chance for the middle class to reclaim some of the income and aggregate wealth that they've lost over the past 40 years. I completely agree. Uh, I kind of take the view that the 1960s generally were around where we should try and aspirationally mm -hmm. be. So I pulled up uh, a study here which basically shows that it's called the 90-10 ratio, the ratio of wealth to the 90 percentile to the top 10 percentile. At that time, it was a 6. Right now, the 90-10 ratio mm -hmm. is a 10. It's all surprisingly, it's gone up exponentially while consumption has remained flat and after-tax income has also generally remained flat for most people. So what does that tell you? Wealth accretion at the top is largely a result of financialization and of more, which means that our current tax scheme and structure is not basically reflective of how things were back in the 1960s, whenever income and taxes and all that was actually a good way in order to tax the majority of money that is around there. So I think it reflects that we need to change our tax system completely. And it's like you said, I don't know what the, you know, I don't know what the ultimate thing was. I know we're living in a more harmonious country back then, at least whenever it came to wealth inequality. So I think that we have to look at it from that perspective around. Well, let's look at our past and say, when did it seem more more equitable, and let's try and return to that with new mechanisms to target new wealth centers. Yeah, and the last thing I would say yeah. is that um, this is a topic that really interests you. There's no one better than Thomas Piketty. Um, oh, yeah. His first yeah. book in particular right. on capital um, will give you everything that you want to know about the history of inequality in the U.S. and other countries around the world um, with a focus on France and why we had that broadening prosperity there, what we can do to re-achieve it now, because these are all policy choices, this world that we're living in. That's right. All right. Thanks for watching. We're going to have more for you later.